In 1677, William Petty said, in all the ancient states and empires, those who had the shipping had the wealth. In the accomplishment of the noble task of building nearly 1,000 ships in the Golden Gate Harbor area, the Shipyard and Marine Shop Laborers Union, Local 886, points with pride to the important part played by its officers and its members in cooperating so closely with the ship construction corporations. In union, there is strength, and only by the closest collaboration and cooperation of all shipbuilding crafts has such a prophecy come true. No greater satisfaction is there in a man's heart than a job well done, and every sincere apprentice and journeyman has the right to be proud of the individual part he played in its final attainment. Behind the glory and splendor are these six men who are all that remain of the original 12 responsible for the organization of Shipyard and Marine Shop Laborers Union Local 886 on a sound basis of service to its members and the shipbuilding industry. The first officers elected received their union book numbers according to their office. Carl Lockwood, first president, was book number one. A.F. Bartholomew, or Bart, as he is called, has book number three, as he was elected secretary treasurer. William Lay proudly carries book number five. Richard Fell, book number six. William Mark smiles because he owns the lucky seven, and Gordon Nickel is the possessor of book number 12. Corporal Jack Lalonde, regularly elected president of the Shipyard and Marine Shop Laborers Union, Local 886, is on leave to Uncle Sam. He has union book number two and is symbolic of the thousands of our members serving in the armed forces. Corporal Lalonde knows well the trials and tribulations of his brethren. When the union started, there were no lockers or washrooms where men could change clothes. Then, as now, ships' double bottoms were oily and dirty. So the brothers had to wash each other off with coal oil. Streetcar conductors refused to let them ride, and yet wages were terrific, 35 cents an hour, and a weekly check for $14 was something to crow about. Introducing Ed Jones, the dean of all shipyard laborers, on the front porch of his home. Ed has not been well lately, and assistant business representative Mitchell has just called on him. Although Ed has never been a member of the Shipyard and Marine Shop Laborers Union, all of the original members of the union worked for him at the time the union was started, and they know that the union owes him much. Ed Jones is now labor superintendent at General Engineering and Dry Dock Company, where he has worked for 27 years. All Dad Jones men love him despite his profanity and his outbursts of temper. They know he's true blue and will always back up his men in a pinch. This is the union's headquarters at 339 13th Street, Oakland, California, in which has been incorporated every up-to-date business facility. This beautiful symbol, showing the clasped hands of brotherly love, typifies this union. Entering the main office, one first sees the receptionist. Her duties include operation of the switchboard and inter-office communications. Sole negotiator from the union's inception has been and is Bart Bartholomew, who maneuvered the laborer supplement to the ship repair contract in 1939, giving good wages and conditions. Sixty-seven and a half cents per hour was the minimum wage agreed to, and the members were so delighted that they held their first celebration since the union charter was granted in 1938. What a contrast with today's wage scale and working conditions. Not one week passes, but many members who were satisfied with their checks based on 67 and a half cents an hour then, now bring in checks to be cashed, which are based on rates as high as $1.45 and a half cents an hour. Vacations with pay, washrooms, and many other advantages have been won the hard way. Here is a check for one week's wages today, thanks to you, Brother Bart. Capable and competent, BART has frequent conferences with shipyard owners and their superintendents to improve wages and working conditions for the members. BART's alert private secretary takes notes on these conferences and rapidly transcribes them. These meetings are so conducted that employers have wholehearted respect for this union and cooperate with it. BART is fair, practical, and logical, while he keeps advantages of the members uppermost in his mind. All agreements are made in writing for the safety of both participants. Men's memories play such strange tricks that Bart likes to feel he can refer to something concrete if a question should arise later, as it often does. Bart's assistants take turns in the office. Let's meet them there. 
William Hutchison, President and Senior Assistant Business Representative, is discussing with his assistant, Art Hill, some of the complex problems of recruiting labor, arranging for their housing, meals, and transportation to the San Francisco Bay Area shipyards. Hutch has labored in every part of both new ship construction and repair, and because of his experiences as a ship laborer, understands the problems that beset his brethren from day to day. Art Hill is well qualified as a recruiter, having done similar work for large corporations. Art has been a member of organized labor for many years. O.K. Mitchell is O.K. to everybody. An honest former banker, he has worked himself up from the double bottom. The Reverend Hatton is better known as Bill. He has spent years in the pulpit and is now working for the good of the membership. Bill performs marriages and renders other spiritual services in addition to his other duties. It's a long jump from sugar beet farming to the shipyards, but John Palfey made it. John is a great hand at getting data from the members and so adjusting pay shortages. Gordon Nickel, holder of Union Book Number 12, is one of the most versatile craftsmen in this area. There is hardly any skilled work he cannot do well. Gordon's knowledge and experience are of great value to the members. Mary Ellen Kufall is the wizard in charge of financial records. She makes out checks, enters all records, and compiles all data. She runs a mile of paper through the calculating machine every month. This is Joe Larson, corresponding, recording, and financial secretary of the union. His duties are manifold and include collection of initiation fees, dues, and reinstatements together with correspondence between this union and other unions and between this union and its members. Joe is discussing with his assistant, H.L. Sander, various problems of the four branch offices after one of his frequent checkup trips. Jim Sander, a former official of a sister local, is also well versed in all these problems. This is one of the most important offices in the union. Individual records, assessments, fines, dues, and initiation fees are registered here. Detailed information about each member, such as age, weight, height, education, and experience, and other factors are recorded for future reference. Modern office equipment speeds work and holds down costs. Every employee, like Nina Bartholomew, expert at posting and correlating records, is selected for his ability. All must be well qualified to be accepted. Before important decisions are made, the executive board members discuss them. They are, from left to right, A.F. Bartholomew, business representative and treasurer, H.A. Larson, member, M. Kubeth, vice president, W.R. Hutchison, president, J.A. Larson, secretary, C.L. Lockwood and C.L. Reiter, members. The board asks all members to consider this a formal introduction and to look closely at their faces so you will recognize them wherever you meet. They are ship laborers themselves and have done about every job their brethren do. So no member should hesitate to approach any officer about any labor problem. The executive board is studying post-war planning and has discussed this important matter with government representatives and industrialists with a view to the future welfare of our present members well knowing that the post-war plans of this union can only provide employment for a limited number. They realize the members of this union must rely on work outside of shipyards to provide employment in the post-war world. are discussing before the board the new World Trade Center, one of hundreds of proposed projects to cost nearly a billion dollars to house consulates, brokerage firms, banks, and so forth. Like a beacon on well-charted seas, this ancient wheel in the boardroom sheds light on the many complex problems to be solved. The secret ritual binds each new member to the other in bonds of brotherhood for their common good. A pledge of loyalty to the Union, their brother members, and their country is given with proper solemnity. Their obligations to the Union and their fellow laborers are outlined to new members by the officers. Their rights, privileges, and benefits are explained, and the oath of allegiance is solemnly administered while the American flag, 
of which we are all so proud, reposes like a divine omen, saying, remember your oath. No favoritism is shown to any color or creed. Every man and woman has exactly the same rights and privileges as the next, except in extenuating circumstances where the member is sick, injured, or otherwise handicapped. Through the famous Golden Gate pass ships of every allied nation on earth, this beautiful harbor is so huge, every vessel afloat on the seven seas could have ample space in it at one time. It is ideal for the gargantuan business which it is anticipated will move to and from these shores in the future. A closer view of the $77 million San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge showing man-made Treasure Island. All shipyards in the district surrounding this bay come under the jurisdiction of Local 886. This building at 9th and Nevin Streets houses the Richmond branch of this and other unions. Here, all members are well served. Introducing Edna Hutchison and her assistant, long experienced in handling union business, they aid hundreds of laborers daily. To serve well, branch offices of the union have been established adjacent to principal shipyards in each county to save members time and walking. The same services are rendered by these branches as at the union's headquarters. Here, members can be dispatched to jobs, pay initiation fees and dues, and discuss their problems. This scene shows Marin Ship, where many residents of Marin and adjacent counties are employed as laborers. For the convenience of these members, our Sausalito office is located just opposite Marin Ship's South Gate. This building was purchased by the Union for its members. The efficiency of Carl Lockwood and his assistants is well known. Carl Lockwood is now close enough for everybody working in Marin Ship to recognize him. He is showing the book that is the open sesame to lucrative jobs in the shipyards in the San Francisco Bay Area. With this book in his possession, a member need never feel he is alone or friendless, for he is brother to thousands of laborers throughout the United States. This union book should be carried at all times, on and off the job. Built as a monument to the winning struggle of labor, this beautiful temple located at 2940 16th Street houses the San Francisco branch office of this union and those of other crafts. This office is in charge of Vivian Duff and her assistant. Misunderstandings between labor and management are settled here. In San Mateo County, the union's branch is located at 202 Grand Avenue, South San Francisco. There, the members are served who are employed in the Western Pipe and Steel and other nearby shipyards. Brother Hutchison is making a personal visit to an injured member who was a labor leader man. A 600-pound sheet of steel fell on this member's leg and broke it at the hip. The union forced the employer to provide every comfort and medical service without cost and obtained a substantial weekly cash benefit for him. Hutch also directs the union's dormitory, victory aid, and recruiting. In rain or shine, day or night, the assistant business representatives of Local 886 go to the various shipyards to contact the members and adjust grievances that may arise. Each assistant is a specialist in some particular field and is assigned so that the members can be best served. Every shipyard is visited often so that all are checked. The frequency of visits to a yard depends on conditions there. Brothers Mitchell and Palfrey have just completed an important conference with the Plant Protection Department and laborers who had a problem and required help from the business representatives. Harry Lumsden is highly educated in the study of law. Harry is a logical and an intelligent assistant business representative. He knows exactly how the union functions and what advantages are being obtained for the members. And now for you bachelors, this sturdy and well-equipped dormitory, owned and operated by the Shipyard and Marine Shop Laborers Union, Local 886, is a comfortable and inexpensive place to live. The entire building is kept impeccably clean inside and out. It is well managed under the direction of President Hutchison, whose duties are to keep the high standard up to par all the time. The linens are immaculately clean, the woolen blankets light and airy, the bed sturdy and the mattress as comfortable as a billowy wave. If a fellow can't sleep here, it's only because he isn't sleepy. Especially trained maids keep the rooms as spick and span as a guest room. 
Rooms are furnished with lockers, table and chairs, which are kept polished. Absolute quiet is observed. Little personal ornaments and pictures add to the hominess of the bachelor's quarters. Washrooms are equipped with mirrors, soap, and fresh clean towels. Plenty of hot water makes washing up and shaving a pleasure. Ample space precludes crowding. As there are a number of washrooms available, nobody is kept waiting, which is important for those who have definite dates to keep or want to be at work on time. Cleanliness is next to godliness, and here is one tenant going all out from top to toe. The dormitory is equipped with the latest and best showers obtainable. Needle spray or flood showers can be had by the mere adjustment of a dial. So that the bachelor members living here will not be lonesome, newspapers from many important centers of the United States and current magazines can be found here. Provided with comfortable couches and chairs and big light windows, this room makes reading a pleasure. As no gambling is allowed, bridge, whist, pinochle, and rummy are played only for enjoyment. Tables and cards are provided for this purpose by the management. There is always a fourth to be had where there are so many good fellows living together. Checker games are also provided by the management. Some very scientific moves have been terribly upset by some dumb fellows who are not so dumb after all. Adequate housing was not generally available for families in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time of filming this scene. That which was available was secured through the federal government by the insistence and pressure from organized labor. Few laborers have been able to secure this type of house in which to live. However, this union has always cooperated fully with its members to secure the best possible housing for their families. And it can be said that because of their efforts, many laborers are enjoying modern, up-to-date housing. These scenes depict rooms in one of the better type of homes that were secured through this union by war workers who patiently waited their turns, sometimes being on waiting lists before construction started. A home like this is well worth waiting for. Tom Agar lost his leg while off the job and was not covered by compensation. The plant police of his yard took up a collection. The shipyard laborers union made up the balance to fit him with an artificial limb. After his terrible experience, Tom is shown back on his feet again. The artificial limb seems strange at first, but thousands of people who have unfortunately lost a limb in due time will be able to do their work just as capably as ever. When showing the remarkable construction of the new leg, Tom jokingly says it has double knee spring action. This union has done much to relieve suffering and aid their brothers. Frank Palomar lost these fingers when his hand was caught in an air fan. The union is trying hard to get a high disability rating for him. A member scratched his elbow accidentally, blotted up the blood with his handkerchief and forgot about it. His arm became seriously infected. So specialists put on a cast from his shoulder to his wrist and are trying desperately to save it. If you get an injury of any kind, report at once to your business representative immediately after getting first aid. Business representative Bartholomew is also secretary treasurer of the Northern California District Council of Laborers, which includes 46 counties. He is also president of the Bay City's Metal Trades Council, which includes all unions in the shipyards as well as in uptown shops that do metalwork. Because of his inherent sincerity, Bart is doing his very best to give members the highest type of service. Red represents blood that has been spent for our cause. White, the purity of our purpose. Blue, fairness and equal opportunities for all.